So the 50 plus one rule, that is something that Manchester United fans would love to see implemented at the club. Getting rid of the Glazers, fans owning the club, it's dreamy. And right now with the protests that are going on against the club, not against the club, sorry, against the Glazers, the 50 plus one slogan is leading it. But what is the 50 plus one rule that is really preeminent out in Germany, in German football? I don't know much about it, but two guys who really do are Felix Tamsit and Matt Ford. Matt and Felix both work for DW Sports out in Germany. And Matt also has contributed to United We Stand for a long, long time. Thank you very much, lads, for joining me and both United fans out in Germany. Hello. Yes, st stuck in exile out here. <laughs> stuck in exile. Well, it's good that you're stuck there because you lads will really know a lot more about the 50 plus one rule. Obviously, it's, it's been, as I said, it's been leading the news. It's the idea of moving away from foreign ownership of English clubs to a situation where fans own the majority of that club is, is dreamy. And Matt, if I can ask you... Like, how would you explain the 50 plus one rule to somebody who really doesn't know anything about it as a sort of, as an, as an introduction? Yeah. Um, it's a good question. It's a question I get, I get asked quite a lot and um, especially over the past week when it's really, really coming to the headlines a bit, it seems to have gained a lot of traction at home. Um, 50 plus one is basically a regulation written into the statutes of the German football league, which stipulates that the members of a German football club must retain control over 50% of the voting shares in their football club's professional football division, plus one share, hence, um, or plus, plus one voting share, um, hence the term 50 plus one. Um, and yeah, this, in principle, that's a pretty simple way of putting it. I'm sure we'll go into more detail as this goes on, but it, it, it ultimately means that for a German football club is protected from um, takeovers or from majority takeovers by external investors, external entities, um, because, yeah, they can invest as much money as they like, but they can never control more than 49% of the voting shares. So they can never control, um, yeah, a, a majority controlling stake in a, in a German football club. That's the... That's the basics of it. That's the basics. But the unfortunate reality, uh, Felix, is that it's far from basic. It's really quite a complicated system, both to implement and to run. And we'll get into the responsibilities behind 50 plus one later on. But there's there's a couple of types of 50 plus one, really, isn't there? There's sort of like a purely a members club. And, and, and then you get towards, uh, I'm, try, I'm trying to remember what it is. It's, uh, it's when you can split the first team off into a separate limited yes. company. Is, is that what it is? Yeah, there are all sorts of, uh, let's call it interpretation of this rule. The basics of what Matt said are absolutely spot on and they're right in most cases, in all cases, arguably, uh, apart from the exceptions about which we'll talk later, I guess. Um, but generally speaking, there are clubs in Germany whose football division is still 100% controlled by the club members, by the paying club members. Um, FSV Mainz is one of them, uh, Schalke is another. Um, there are some clubs who still run like that. Um, other, the more common uh, uh, practice in Germany is the uh, sort of outsourcing of the football department into a game they are, which is a limited company basically, uh, which allows more economic freedom. Um, it's still largely controlled by the members. They're the ones who get to make calls, personal calls, for instance, uh, and they're the ones who uh, deserve answers um, once a year when there's a AGNs and stuff like that. Um, there's also uh, obviously clubs who do not operate within the 50 plus one means due to investment of more than 20 to, due to significant investment i need to say um of the uh investor for more than 20 years like tsk hoffenheim for instance uh or some clubs uh like red bull or rb leipzig as they are known to circum circumvent the 50 plus one rule in um some ways or the other but the basics are that there are all sorts of interpretations of this rule there isn't a single way to run a club in accordance with the 50 plus one rule um and uh, i'm pretty sure it's going to be uh, interesting to find out how uh, how english fan and how english clubs would interpret the rule should it be implemented there 
Now, uh, Matt, the, the 50 plus one rule is not exactly, I wouldn't say it's universally accepted. There, are, There's there's lobbying that has to happen every year to make sure it stays in place. Is is that something that is quite prevalent out in Germany or is it on, on the larger scale? Is it is it widely is it widely accepted? And I suppose the second question leading on from that is obviously the Super League that's happened at the moment. Dortmund and Bayern were never involved in any way, shape or form. Now, now was... And I asked, I asked Felix this before we went on camera. Do you feel that was sort of partly at least because of the 50 plus one rule? I mean, the two questions are linked. Um, so to go back to your first question as to, to the extent to which this is accepted or the extent to which it is, it, it has its detractors, it absolutely has its detractors. Um, 50 plus one and the whole concept of it is probably the biggest, like, socio-political battlefield in German football. It goes to the, it goes to the heart of pretty much any supporter protest you can think of. So whether that was protests against Monday night football, protests against rising ticket prices, protests to main, to, to, to retain standing terraces, uh, protests against the involvement of, of Red Bull, all this sort of stuff, it's all fundamentally down to the 50 plus one rule and the fact that the fact that fans uh, don't just uh, don't just think that they have a say in, in, in their club, it is literally their club. Um, which is a bit of a, a difference to, to when we in England talk about our clubs. Um, however, like I said, yeah, there are there are there, there are detractors, and that um, yeah, that go it goes back to the the very the very heart of the rule and the very heart of the, the reason that it exists in the first place. Um, up until nineteen ninety eight, every single German club was run in the way that Felix was describing. Um, One hundred percent members associations um there aren't many left felix mentioned schalke he mentioned mites i think there's also Nuremberg, san paoli and, and a few others uh, up until 1998 they were all run like that they were they were not-for-profit organizations um and eventually the time came where these clubs wanted investment but you wouldn't get an investor investing in a 100 percent member controlled club because they then couldn't control where their investment was going to go and this in this issue of investors being able to control their investment is really really key and um, that's why in 1998 they were allowed to form these separate limited companies which housed their professional football divisions investors from outside could then invest as much as they want into that professional football division, a limited company, a PLC, there's all sorts of various forms, plus your Dortmund, like you mentioned, is on the stock exchange. They all have various ways of doing it, um, but they all remain under the ultimate control of the parent club, the parent association, and the members of that club. Um, yeah, the if you ask detractors of the 50 plus one rule, what the problem with that is, is that they will say it limits or it discourages investment and they're absolutely right. It, it does. Um, and the, the biggest example of this in recent years has been the situation at Hanover, currently in, in the second division, but a few years ago in the Bundesliga. They're actually in the, in the Europa League, UEFA Cup at one point recently. Um, they've had a long-term investor by the name of a man called Martin Kint. He's a, he's a hearing aid manufacturer from, from, near, from near Hanover. Very, very, very wealthy man. Uh, yeah, local investor, been involved in investing in Hanover for, for years. He wanted to invest even more money, but only on the condition that he could control the club in its entirety. However, so he, yeah, however, you know, the 50 plus one rule stipulated that he couldn't do that unless, and that's the key, unless he acquired an exemption from the 50 plus one rule. And as Felix mentioned, there are exemptions. Exemptions are actually, they're, they're absolutely legitimate. They're written into the rule. If an investor can prove that he has invested or, or she has invested, um, I think the wording is consistently and substantially uh, for a period of 20 years without interruption. If they can prove that, then they can then have an exemption from the rule and take over majority control of the club. That is the case with Wolfsburg. Uh, and Volkswagen and with Leverkusen and the Bayer pharmaceutical company and most recently with uh, Dietmar Hopp in, in Hoffenheim. Martin Kint in Hanover also wanted this. However, the supporters were able to prove beyond any reasonable doubt that he hadn't actually supported the club consistently enough or substantially enough for a period of 20 years for that exemption to be allowed and therefore it was thrown out. Um, and he's he's actually since been voted down as president as well. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, that's 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 where this debate over control and investment and whether it's 
whether it whether it limits clubs, whether it limits investment, that's where it all comes from. And of course, ultimately, yes, it does limit investment, and that is the price that German football fans pay. Um, yeah, it's a it's an absolutely legitimate argument to say that if these investors were allowed to invest much much more, and there was an incentive for them to invest much much more, then perhaps German clubs would be able to compete a little bit better when it you know, against English clubs in, in the Champions League. It's an absolutely valid argument. However, at w- what price do you want to pay for that? And that's where a lot of German fans would say, we're happy, we're happy to not compete as long as we have control. Um, and that then brings me on to your second question, <laughs> the Super League. And to what extent did the 50 plus one rule keep Bayern and Dortmund out of the Super League? And that was the biggest question from uh, from back on Monday morning when the news broke. And for quite a few hours, I was sort of telephoning around, trying to work out exactly what the, what the deal is here. Because uh, it sounds very simple, doesn't it? It sounds almost utopian to say, oh yeah, it's obvious that Bayern and Dortmund are getting involved because they're controlled by the fans. But I don't think it's quite as simple as that. However, I did manage to speak to the director of of one Bundesliga club um, who confirmed to me, he said that, okay, his club hadn't been asked to join the Super League, but if they had been, it's not a decision that his club could have taken without asking their members because it was of such strategic importance. Therefore, he believed that the 50 plus one rule certainly would have at least played some sort of role in the back of Karl-Heinz Rummenigge's mind at, at Bayern Munich. The fact that does does he really have a mandate to drag Bayern Munich out of the Bundesliga? And yeah, to some extent, that played a role. And uh, uh, Karl Hans Rummenegger, for those who don't know him, is is a man who's not exactly shy of controversy. So if if he's gonna maybe put the brakes on because of that, then I think that sort of shows that everybody else would have. Now, now Felix, uh, I think the most important question for not just Man United fans, because as 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 much as this is. A conversation about the Glazers, about our particular club's ownership. Protests are happening at Arsenal over Stan Kroenke. Protests are going to be happening at Liverpool over FSG. Abramovich and Chelsea, City, I, I don't, they, they'll be fine because they're, they're all money anyway, but that's a different conversation. But this is now... A, the, the thing that feels different about this movement compared to 2010, for example, is that it's a national sentiment. It's not just United fans being angry at Glazers. It's it's a it's a football football together as a fan base is angry at foreign ownership. Now, how does the fifty plus one rule actually come about in terms of how can English fans actually expect it to happen? Is it something that needs to be pushed by the government with legislation? Is it something that the clubs the decisions they make themselves, or is it the fan protests that are happening, or is it everything combined? You know. How can we actually expect it to be implemented in England, the 50 plus one rule? Well, I'm not an expert on legislation, but what I can say is that the 50 plus one rule in Germany, it doesn't exist in, in, in a void. The 50 plus one rule in Germany exists because uh, it has uh, a certain social, uh, it, there's the understanding that football is of social importance. And in order to understand the implementation of it in Germany, it also needs to be said that uh, the concept of non-profits exists in German society in so many areas of life, uh, be it uh, in your in your area where you live in your city, a group of people uh, gather together to try and uh, lobby for better pathways for bicycle riders. That's also a non-profit. Uh, the biggest non-profit, this sort of non-profit in Germany, is actually for the rights of uh, of vehicle drivers, like uh, it's called ADAC. So this goes just this goes to show there's a notion of organization which goes which stretches way way beyond football. Um, this understanding exists in German society. Um, you two know British society or English society better than I do, uh, but it needs to be said that uh, this uh, yeah having agency over your own club, having a say, uh, comes with lots of responsibility. It comes with um, lots of uh, need to engage for your club, spend time uh, off the, you know, regardless of the games themselves, uh, to sort of uh, maintain this agency over your club. It doesn't, even in Germany, there is those who keep on challenging uh, the 50 plus one rule. One of them is, by the way, Karl-Heinz Hummenigge, 
um, one of the biggest advocates of opening uh, German football for foreign investments. Um, so it takes lots of work, it takes lots of uh, uh, engagement from the fan side of things. Um, whether it's worth it or not, it's up to every single fan or in Germany's case, club member to decide. I get the impression that most of them uh, are for the 50 plus one world to, to remain, uh, for, its for it to be strengthened even. There's been lots of protests uh, over this issue over the past few years. Uh, and it's absolutely key for the way German football has been run, mostly here in Germany. Like uh, you get lots of discussions about it abroad, lots of discussion mostly among you know the clubs which are well supported internationally, like Borussia Dortmund and Bayern Munich. Uh, people say that uh, you know people that don't necessarily uh, live here and don't necessarily live through this this experience of having proper agency over your club. Um, there's different views, but here I get the impression that the vast majority of fans and indeed club members um, are for it to remain and be strengthened and they're willing to go to uh, far lengths for it to happen, absolutely. I, I, I do think that, I think society has proved in England over the last week with the reaction to the Super League, how important football is to society and how, I mean, Gary Neville is, is probably being the most vocal in terms of his position, in terms of speaking out about it. And he's actually called it the attempted murder of English football as we know it, which I agree with. I genuinely I genuinely felt last Monday that Man United was dead as a club uh, in terms of what I my memories of it are and were and what my experiences of United would be going forward if we were in a league where we couldn't get kicked out of. Uh, it's just, I obviously wouldn't take up, take up, away from the domestic league, but it would just, it would tarnish everything. Um, back to you, Matt. I think a really important thing for United fans to understand is, say this comes in, say the 50 plus one happens and the rule is sort of implement, implemented. How would that actually theoretically happen at Manchester United? As I said before, uh, Man United are a publicly traded company. We're listed on the New York Stock Exchange. Uh, that complicates things. Uh, obviously, Borussia Dortmund, they're a publicly traded company and they're under the 50 plus one rule. Uh, what would what should we expect the actual structure of it to be Or what, in, in your eyes? Obviously, this is all hypothetical, so don't take this all as fact. But hypothetically, this does get implemented in, in England. How how will it actually look at Manchester United in terms of the actual ownership structure? In terms of implementing 50 plus one in its in its entirety, um, as much as I think it's an absolutely laudable and legitimate aim, and you should always aim high, and obviously that there's a reason that that's the focus of the uh, of, of of the planned the planned protest on uh, on on Sunday ahead of the Liverpool game. Um, if we if we're being honest, um, the implementation or the, the almost the reverse engineering into a situation where we have 50 plus one like it's in Germany um, is, is highly unlikely. Um, doesn't mean we shouldn't aim for it, but you know the uh, probably the the more realistic end game is that by aiming for that, we then end up settling for something a little bit in between. Um, and again, we're on to hypotheticals, but it could be, I've heard talk of um, something along the lines of a, of a, of a golden share um, or, or guaranteed support and representation on boards or at least on supervisory boards. Um, there's all sorts of ways of going about it. Um, Felix mentioned earlier, it ultimately would require legislation um, from government level, and um, I don't think it's controversial to say to uh, without getting overly political about it. But um, I thought it was quite intriguing to hear what Boris Johnson reportedly had to say during the week. Um, at first, the suggestion that he would have uh, that he was that he was ag against the Super League, um, and. And uh, and then after that, in in favour of fifty plus one, it was it was mental to hear the fifty plus one rule being quoted at a press conference in Downing Street. Never thought I'd see the day. Um, but if we think about it, you know, for the, the Super League represented, it was the the absolute the absolute embodiment, the very 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 pinnacle of hyper capitalist free market vulture behavior by some of the some of the richest institutions and most powerful institutions in in, in world football um 
not something that Boris Johnson is particularly known for being against um, in, in other areas of, of society. So to then hear Boris Johnson say that his government is, is, is in favour of models similar to 50 plus one, in other words, state interference in, in, in the private economy, is also not really something that tallies with um, with, with with the current government's position on, on on that on that sort of state intervention. So, I take Boris Johnson's comments with a little bit of a pinch of salt. I don't think that's overly controversial, um, but it would take government intervention, um, and we've never been closer to that ultimately since two thousand ten eleven. Anyway, we've never been closer to that than than, than we are now. Um, the momentum is there. Um, Sam, you mentioned, you know, Gary Neville's intervention, which I think he does, does a lot of credit for, for getting the ball rolling on that. I think that that little speech that he made on uh, on, on on Sky, um, yeah, I think I think that that really got the ball rolling. Um, this is a topic which is being discussed. Fans have taken to the streets. There's a sense of unity and a sense of purpose um, that, that's not been there at all in, in uh, over the past over the past ten years. Um, and then I think what your question was also getting at is there, yeah, there might be there might be unity and purpose, but is there a plan B? Is there an alternative? Is there a, is there an end game? Um, mm. And yeah, that's where that's where we're, we're relying on um, yeah some sort of intervention, um, some some sort of some sort of government legislation. The alternative, I suppose, is to rely on. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but to rely on the Glazers' goodwill. But then again, that was actually the tenor of. The uh, of the letter penned by uh, penned by Jim by by, by Jim, uh, Jim Jim O'Neill um, recently and, and and Paul Paul Marshall to um, well yeah two two members of the so called the so called Red Knights um, who were prominent at least back in two thousand and, and ten eleven um, and they said you know if um, if Mister if Mister Joel Glazer is serious about what he wrote in his apology that you know he, that he is that he is sorry and. <laughs> He does want to listen to supporters, which he's made no in, you know, he's made no sign of doing for the past 15, 16 years. But if he does, then this is the time to do it. Um you could do it tomorrow morning. Give the fan give the fans a say. Um we'll see what happens. <laughs> well, something that uh, Felix that you you mentioned before uh was something that I hadn't really thought about at all. Because from where we are now with the Glazers. Therefore, 50 plus one is perfect situation. But you were talking about the extra responsibilities that come alongside that implementation. And that's something that can't really be taken for granted because if it does come in, Manchester United fans are therefore going to be directly responsible for the running of the club. What what could you, what, hypothetically, again, it comes into place. What are those responsibilities and, and what sort of impact has that had on I suppose the fans' relationship with their own clubs in the own in, inside the Bundesliga and and the second Bundesliga as well. Well, you're right to point out that it, that it does come with lots of responsibility. It comes with the need of uh, understanding that you're gonna be putting in lots of hours into inner politics within your own club. Obviously, 50 plus one is all well and good, but at the end of the day, not all club members and indeed fans have the same view. Uh, you have to persuade people that your sort of view or your vision for the club is the right one. Uh, lots and lots of inner politics, lots of conflicts. Um, we're talking about hour-long AGMs. Like I've, I'm also an FC Cologne member, FC Cologne. Um, the last uh, AGM which took place uh, with people in attendance took seven hours in which people criticized each other, shouted at each other. Um, they had the opportunity to ask the board all sorts of questions, which triggered lots and lots and lots of more questions. Um, it's basically politics. That's the downside of things. And another downside of things is, as Matt rightly points out, um, democracy costs you money. Democracy costs you efficiency. This needs to be said. Um, having said that, you, I get the impression that the fact that fans here, or club members in Germany's case, uh, the fact that they are effectively in control over their club, over the ideals that, that are behind the club, over the people that run the club to a certain degree. Obviously, we're not talking about everything. It's not like club members in general appoint coaches or managers. That's not the case. Uh, but they do vote for their president and usually uh, also vice presidents. The supervisory board is also something you vote on, uh, which represents, which then represents the members in front of 
the board which runs the company in most cases. Again, those structures are extremely complicated and they result in your in a club being less efficient than a club that's being run by an oligarch or by a by a totalitarian state or anything along those lines. Um, when one person makes the cause, it tends to be uh, yeah, just uh, more effective in terms of you know, running the company and doing stuff. But at the end of the day, the fact that people here have voting rights, people here uh, take active part in forming their clubs uh, present and futures, um, it's something which means that clubs here are uh, enjoy lots of support locally. You see the, the level of support that clubs have in their regions, for instance. Obviously, there are clubs uh, which are give, being supported all over Germany. You're talking about Bayern Munich, uh, Borussia Dortmund, Schalke, um, Gladbach to a certain degree, Hamburg and all sorts of others. Uh, but generally speaking, uh, supporter culture in Germany has a local stake, which means that once things go wrong, once there's a time of crisis, once there's a time in which fan engagement is needed, fans will be there because not be not only because they love the club, they obviously love the club. Uh, you know, emotions towards your club is something that I would assume it's the same anywhere. I mean, you love your club because you love it. That's just how you. That's just how we're programmed in a way as football fans. Uh, but the difference is that here, people can actually do something about it. People can actually vote for or against certain certain people in certain position. People can vote for or against certain statutes, um, which are included in uh, how the club is being run and operates. Uh, it, it's also a matter of, for an instance. Uh, deciding the sort of uh, political ideals behind your club. How much do you want your club to um, engage against stuff like racism and stuff like all sorts of issues that get mixed up. Um, it takes lots of energy, lots of inner politics. And again, it in comparison to what we see in the Premier League nowadays, where you have uh, that's largely being considered the best league in the world with all sorts of top stars, footballers receiving enormous amounts of money. Um, if 50 plus one would be implemented the way it is in Germany, there's no other way of saying it. Uh, it means less money. Um, but at the end of the day, it means, again, speaking out of Germany's experience, it means more connection to your club. It means more agency over your club. It means more decision making, more the ability to have a say, not only supporting your club, but being literally a part of it, as Matt rightly points out. There's a word there that Felix has used a couple of times, agency, and that's that's really really key. Um, and I, I I often think I get get asked a lot that you know what, what are the direct effects of fifty plus one? What, what sort of things do they vote for then? Does that mean they're voting for I don't know what flavor ketchup they have on their hot dog stands or I, I don't know? But no, no the, the biggest effect of fifty plus one is not necessarily those direct those direct decisions that you make, you don't really make direct decisions. You, know, you, you you elect certain positions, as Felix was explaining. But the indirect effect of it is, in my opinion, much more important because it, it gives fans a sense of agency, a sense of ownership, more than a sense of ownership. It's a fact of, of ownership. And that is what leads to all the other more visual elements that people might be more familiar with with German football. When people think about the Bundesliga or German football, you know, they associate it with standing terraces, with raucous atmospheres, cheaper tickets. You can have a beer in view of the pitch. Um, yeah, fl flags, banners, choreographies, big ultra groups, that, that, that sort of stuff. All of that's just a tip. That's just a visible tip of the iceberg. That all takes place because ultimately the fans have a sense of agency underpinning it, and that's what's and, and that is because of the fifty plus one rule because they they do have a legal stake. So it's not necessarily the the direct decision making that you have week in week out of voting for stuff. That's that that's not how it works. If anything, the the, the much 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 bigger effect is this indirect, slightly slightly more intangible effect that, that it has in, in, in the background. Um, a key example of that recently was the protests against Monday Night Football, which I think people, even in, in the UK or elsewhere, may, may have caught wind of. Basically, yeah, M Monday Night Kickoffs were eventually abolished in Germany because the fans kicked off. They decided, they said, no, these this is unsociable. It's, uh, you know, no, it's... 
it's also it's kick up time. We, we don't want to do Monday nights. Uh, Monday nights put the TV viewer ahead of the ahead of the match goer, and that's not fair. So we're going to do something about it. And they did something about it because they know that ultimately they own their they they not own but they they control their clubs. Um, so you had all these protests, particularly in in Dortmund and and Frankfurt. Um, and Mainz as well, as well were also quite quite vocal. Um, Ver Ver de Bremen as well, and um, yeah, they they had these protests against against Bundesliga football because they said it was it was against their interests, and ultimately they won because when the German Football League announced its next TV deal and the accompanying kickoff times, etc., and the, the the broadcast times, they said right now for the next four years, okay, no more. No more Monday games because the German Football League knew that its members, the clubs, were controlled by their members, the fans, who didn't want Monday night football, and they kicked up a fuss about it. And again, it's it's an indirect and yet very very strong link to the fact that fifty plus one gives fans this sense of agency and this sense that no, it's our club and we will decide. You know, similar to that banner that the United lads had at Cavington the other the, the other day we decide when you play i can uh i just want to touch one point that much just said um yeah that uh i think is 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 vital to the discussion it's extremely important um because we do see lots of fan protests in germany out of this sentiment be it indirectly or indirectly out of this sentiment of having a say over your own club uh but as Matt pointed out, uh, the fan protests we see at the stadium is only the tip of the iceberg. If we take the Monday night football uh, protests, for instance, we've all seen the protests. Uh, but what we did not see is many club members, indeed fans, uh, sending uh, angry messages to their club bosses, asking to talk to the board, asking to talk to the president. Um, using the AGMs, the, the yearly meetings to discuss the club's current situation, to demand answers as to how, whether the club supports it going forward. Those are all things that happen in the background, which in England, not only in England, also here in Germany, you just don't see it coming across um, on the visual side of things. But these are vital, vital parts of, um, of the fan culture in Germany, of football culture in Germany. Um, the fact that uh, you can send your club an email, just as another example, from here, from Cologne, where uh, recently the club appointed a new uh, media officer. Um, and uh, after his appointment, some fans, uh, some, you know, many fans, on, many uh, FC Cologne fans on Twitter started looking for that person's history. He used to work for the Bild site, who wrote all sorts of articles and tweeted all sorts of tweets about uh, not not exactly positive tweets about uh, FF second fans or about fans in general, about ultras, had all sorts of, uh, let's call it uh, dubious views when it comes to uh, uh, refugees and stuff like that. Those, when these things came to light, people started emailing the board, people started emailing the president. Did you check these things? Did you uh, appoint this person knowing that these are his views? If that is the case, I have a problem with it, and I will make sure this problem that I have with it will become known in the next uh, general meeting, in the next AGM. Uh, this resulted in the appointment being cancelled, um, and this just this is just one small case which shows uh, what it means in practice. It means fan protests, it means uh, a commitment, and it means being part of your own club, but it also means lots of work in the background and lots of yeah, politics among fans and among fan groups in particular. Well, I, I think for a lot of United fans, uh, obviously the FC United fans in Manchester in particular, they have felt disconnected from Man United for the last, what is it now, 15, 16 years since the Glazers took over. So the concept of actually taking a more central role and actually, uh, even if it's a 0.01%, but taking part in being uh, involved in that decision-making process of the club is something that, I mean, I'd love to. And I'm sure there's thousands and thousands of fans that would love to as well. Um, in terms of actually getting that part of the ownership, how does it actually work? Is it a case of you just you go and you just buy a share and all of a sudden you've you've got a voting right? How, how does it actually work, Matt, in, in terms of being part of the 50 plus one? It's pretty simple. Like, like you just said, yeah, you become a member. Your Felix is a member of Cologne. That gives him a vote. 
Um, how, oh, that's how, very simple. How, 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 how many members are there of Cologne? 100 and how many thousand? 111,000. Yeah, I can so only talk about how I joined the club, just yeah. to, to sort of give an example. Um, every single club in Germany, which is being run according to the 50 plus or still being run by its members, uh, has lots of campaigns of joining the club and stuff. I personally joined, I think it was three years ago. Um, you pay member, a membership fee. In my case, it's about 100 euros or 110 euros, uh, which, are, which obviously allows you access to tickets and all sorts of other things, access to the waiting list for a season ticket, which is massive in Germany because prices are largely uh, lower and much more affordable than in the UK. Not, not everywhere, but uh, in most cases. Um, and then you receive uh, you receive emails from the board. You receive constant updates about the club's financial situation. You receive uh, um, all sorts of updates about uh, the club's fan culture and the club's uh, you know day to day life in the city. Almost uh, you obviously get an invitation to the AGM, uh, where you have the right to ask. Uh, the board and uh, basically, largely speaking, the people in leading position, all sorts of questions. Um, you can obviously engage with them, <clears throat> sorry, in conversation. And at the end of the day, you have to vote on things. You have to vote on whether the club's president and, and his or her vice president will continue to serve in the roles. You vote on whether certain statutes would be uh, would be uh, would come into the club's uh, statutes permanently. Um, we've seen cases of uh, club members uh, lobbying for or be becoming active for their clubs, for instance, uh, having a human rights clause within their statutes and all sorts of stuff like that in Germany. Um, it really is a very, very broad spectrum of stuff which comes with it, but the very basics of it, yeah, that's right. You basically pay for a membership and a club. We all remember, we, we have to remember, we're talking about football clubs. That's the basics of it. You're a member of a club, uh, which has a certain purpose. Uh, it's like yeah. that if you're active for your own region or for your city. It's like that if you're active for, uh, I don't know, bicycle, cyclist rides or stuff like that. And in Germany, it's like that with your local football club. Do um do season ticket holders uh, have more power in terms of a voting right than say just a normal member? Because obviously United, you can be a normal member and you can be a season ticket holder. Is, is that the same sort of concept out there, or is it just everyone's the same? Everyone's exactly the same. I mean, I, I'm also a Man United member because I, I obviously go to lots of uh, Euro ways. Uh, but comparing my membership uh, at SFC Köln and my membership at MUFC is a, it's it's completely different worlds. Like basically, your, your MUFC membership allows you to receive what a ten percent discount when you go to the me mega store or whatever that is, and obviously access to tickets, which matters to me. As as I said, uh, my 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 MUFC dose is only uh, MUFC uh, Euro ways. Um, but which is how we met. Yeah, uh, incidentally <laughs> enough, a few years ago. Uh, but uh, yeah, but basically speaking, it's completely different worlds. My SF Second membership, my Cologne membership, allows me to have a say um, about the, the club's future. The people who run my club, the people who will have a say about you know appointing a sporting director, appointing the CEO of the uh, of the limited company which runs the football department. Um, allows me, for instance, uh, you know, just to give an example, which matters to me, um, I'm Jewish and I want my club to engage more against anti-Semitism in Germany, just as an example. Um, and I've been in discussion with some leading positions at SFC Köln, one of Germany's biggest clubs, um, to ask how they're gonna, how they, how they're gonna become active in this in this area going forward. Um, this is just one of many, many examples. Um, and uh, again, the comparison between my MUFC membership and my membership in Africa, completely different worlds. I think Cologne no. is probably actually quite a good example. Um, I've not got numbers off the top of my head, but it's all right seeing that all these members get, get a say. Um, it's also then down to them to actually make the most of it and actually act upon that. And, you know, it'd be a, it'd be a lie to say that everyone does. Um, Bayern Munich have, I think, as I, when I last looked, about 290,000 members. Um, now, I'm not going to sit here and lie to you and say that 290,000 people are turning up or tuning into Bayern Munich's AGMs and voting. They're absolutely not. They'll get a few hundred if they're lucky. I think one of one of 
Borussia Dortmund's recent AGMs, I think about three or four hundred turned up. I, I do believe Cologne and some others are actually a bit better. You tend to get a few thousand getting involved. Um, but yeah, let's let, let's also not completely over over idealize things and say that everyone's deciding everything. A lot of people just just can't be bothered and and you know <laughs> don't don't get involved. But then again, when you don't get involved, and then Bayern Munich start signing off sponsorship deals with Qatar and going on training camps to Doha. And then you, you can't complain. complain. Well, exactly. So you know, get get, get involved first, and um, yeah, um, so a, a lot of fans do. If anyone, you know, if you've watched any Bayern Munich game before the pandemic, barely a game went by without some sort of banner uh, of, from from their hardcore behind the goals slagging off their own club, and mm. they have every right to slag off their own club because they are the club. Yeah. So now, I I I think something that I'd be interested to know for for sort of end this conversation from both of you is your opinion on on where you see the next three months going because obviously right now the sentiment is extremely strong against the ownership uh, foreign ownership inside uh, inside England because of the European Super League that's now being translated into power against hopefully getting these owners out which I can only see as a good thing but uh, I was I remember the protest back in 2010 obviously you saw the remember the march that happened before Spurs there was it was huge sentiment there, and ultimately the Red Knights' uh, takeover bid didn't really quite go through, uh, and nothing happened. Do you expect there to actually be real change after all this is said and done, Felix? Or do you think that in six months' time we're just going to look back at this as a case of when football fans fought back to stop the European Super League, but then everything else went back to normal after? I'll start with the good news as far as I'm concerned. And the good news is that, as Matt rightly pointed out, the momentum right now seems to me as stronger than 2010. It seems to me like uh, due to the seriousness of the situation, due to the uh, how explicit this was, the whole Super League story, uh, I do get the impression that uh, lo- many more people are taking part in the discussion, many more people are informing themselves about alternative ownership models, many people are informing themselves about their own owners, uh, which is mostly uh, relevant to international fans who aren't necessarily involved. Uh, you know, I come from Israel, for instance, and many people started asking me personally from my fan club in Israel, what is the 50 plus one rule? What is everyone talking about? So this is a discussion that has been taking place uh, in a lot, uh, in stronger intensity, I get the impression than back then. Uh, I think it's up to uh, fan representatives, and it's up to us as fans to sort of capitalize on that. It also, there's also other elements of it which aren't necessarily up to us, as Matt says, legislation involved, political involvement from all sorts of political parties would be a big factor of it because. Um, uh, just like Matt uh, rightly pointed out, I don't think that fans alone can decide that things will change. It's not in their hands. It's in the hands of partly the Glazers, partly the British government, um, all sorts of other powerful elements of British society and indeed European society in many cases. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see how this pans out. But I, I can only uh, I can only hope that this sentiment would lead to MUC having a much more sustainable um, fan connected ownership model, which allows fans to have a say in in one capacity or the other. That's my biggest hope. I hope you're right. What about yourself, Matt? How how can you see this going in the next few months? Yeah, like I said before, I hope it's a wake up call. Um, I hope that. I mean, the, the Glazers haven't been popular since two thousand and five. Um, however, to varying degrees, people have turned a blind eye, haven't they? Um, and if, yeah, and for various reasons, you know, because they, they, for whatever reason, weren't prepared to, to walk away and go to FC United. And whether you did or whether you didn't is they're both absolutely legitimate choices. There shouldn't shouldn't be the time for for turning round, pointing fingers, and giving it giving it. I told you so. Um, but I think by now, the mask the mask has slipped. Um, we've debated for years. And even now, you know, is is, Sol- is Solskjaer a good manager? Was Mourinho the right man? Was Van Gaal the right man? This transfer, that transfer, where's the club go? All, all this ultimately, all absolutely irrelevant. All absolutely missing the point because the entire decision making structures at the club, 
and the very foundations of the club have been neglected and exploited um, and ran into the ground, um, you know, physically ran to the ground. You know that that stadium has barely had a lick of paint in in sixteen years. That's that's how serious how, how serious the neglect is. Um, ne- ne- never mind the, the figure of of how of how many one point whatever billion pounds it is now that's been spent that's been spent on debt and and dividends and and interest repayments. That's all been clear. I think even even more disastrous has been the neglect of the decision making structures which have left United. Um, up until recent changes, admittedly this season, there have been a few structural changes at the club which have been promising, but left United light years behind um, our, what, should, what should be our, our peers in England and, and in Europe. Um, and I feel like not just at United, but probably elsewhere, um, Liverpool fans will probably tell a similar story of the issues they've had with FSG down the years. Um they had the issue with your know, £77 tickets, which they protested against. There was the attempt by the club to copyright the name of the city or some, something along those lines, which they had that issue. Um, there was Liverpool's attempted use of the government furlough scheme, which showed a complete disconnect of the role of Liverpool within the city of Liverpool and what it stands for. And United have had obviously various issues with, with the Glazers down the years and the money and the dividends being taken out. Um, and yet... For one reason or another, we've we've all we've all gone, yeah, but we'll still go. It's still our it's still our club somehow. Some somehow it's still Arsenal, it's still United, it's still Liverpool, it's still Chelsea. But I hope now the mask has fallen. It's if it wasn't clear to anyone before, it must be clear now as to what the end game is for these owners. I I I think and I hope you're right. I mean, myself personally, I've I mean, over the last few years, the amount of pointless arguments I've had with people trying to say, oh, look, United are signing Di Maria, United are signing Pop Oh, there's, there's nothing wrong with your owners. And I'm like, oh, God, there's literally wasted oxygen. But I think it's, it's almost, it is ironic that effectively the owners of these clubs have loaded the gun, which is now pointing at them. Because this, this money grab that they went for is now turned into the biggest fuel that is ever going to be behind this movement. And if ownership structures do change in England, it will, as far as I'm concerned, it will happen now. If it doesn't happen now, I don't see anything happening in the future, which is going to be a stronger um, motivation and power behind it. So fingers crossed it does. Uh, and maybe it will be the 50 plus one. Maybe it'll be something different. As you said, maybe something slightly in between. But whatever it is, as far as United fans are concerned, it's surely going to be better than Glazers, right? Absolutely, you should strike while the iron's hot. Um, yeah, get yourself to that football ground on Sunday if you can. And, yeah, if you can. Um, yeah, get down. I there. mean, yeah, if, uh, obviously, I'll plug the protest now. It's going to happen at 2 p.m., uh, organised by uh, TRA and uh, Must as well. But it's, the, the protests were big in 2010. I'm really hoping that this one can be a little bit bigger and a little bit better. And it's not to belittle the protest that happened on Saturday, but when it comes to Sunday, National TV cameras are going to be there. They're going to be there for the United Liverpool game. And on a match day, there's going to be more eyeballs on it. So get down there, get down there, be peaceful, wear a mask, be COVID safe, but make as much noise as possible. Um, really appreciate, Matt and Felix, both of your time today. I hope this video has, has helped you understand and saw an explainer of what the 50 plus one rule is, but also what the nuances and the, the social and political responsibilities that come alongside it. It's not just... A puppy for Christmas. It's uh, you know, it's it's going to grow into a, a big dog over the next few years, and you've got to make sure that you feed it well, you treat it well, and you don't just neglect it and not go to the AGM because if you do, what was the point in fighting fifty plus one in the first place, right? I like that. Fifty plus one is for life, not just for Christmas. I can get, I can get, I can get on board with that. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, pretty appreciate your time uh, today, lads, uh, and maybe we'll speak again in the future if something else can happen. Uh, I'll leave both of your Twitter accounts inside the comments because I can't remember them off the top of my head now. If you want to plug yours, uh, I suppose you can plug them. Yeah. If, you, well, if you've got anything to plug yourself. Well, just I'm at Matt underscore 4D, but more importantly, um, sign up to United We Stand. There's loads of stuff in there, uh, loads of stuff on 50 plus one, lots of insight from Germany and, um, yeah, sort of insight that that you don't get without actually paying for things. So it's important. Sign up, it is important. Sign up to the mag. <laughs> yeah. Um, Felix yourself. 
Uh, I'm on Twitter at FTamsud, and I'd like to support Matt's call, like uh, support your local fanzines. Fanzine culture is an incredibly important part of uh, MUFC fan culture. That's how I used to inform myself uh, of MUFC fan culture when I used to live in Israel. I used to read, uh, uh, I used to read uh, Red Issue, I used to read, read United We Stand, all sorts of uh, mags which helped me understand my club better. And they do need your support, especially given COVID-19. So, uh, yeah, meet you on Twitter and support your local fans. I like how both your sentiments there. And as I said, I hope this is the watershed moment for change that it that it could be, uh, and that maybe in a in a month's time or so we can talk about how bad the Glazers the Glazers ownership was and how great fifty plus one is or whatever it is going to be going forward for maybe a brighter future for United. But really appreciate your time today, guys. Yeah, cheers, Sam. Cheers. Thank you, Sam.